Good morning, and welcome to New Hanover County Schools, The Morning Show. I'm Johanna Carey. And I'm Jessica Finnegan. This is the week of May 22nd through the 28th. Next Monday, May 29th, is Memorial Day, and we celebrate it all week long on our show. We have a special segment titled Lessons in Liberty, and today's show is also packed with many other superb features. In our newly popular and always interesting segment, Science Nation, we learn about a term a team of scientists working to make transparent solar power cells, which could one day replace windows. And we take a look ahead and see the top events across the state planned during the month of June in our fantastic segment, NC Happenings. It is going to be another great show. But first, let's check in with our news anchor, Hannah Bolick, which is standing by with your school news headlines. Good morning, Hannah. Good morning, Johanna and Jessica, and welcome everyone to Your School News here on The Morning Show. Topping the headlines this week, Trask students build and program robots, Laney Marketing 2 class targets drunk driving dangers, and CTEC first class gathers for greet and meet. We will have all these stories and more coming up later in the show. Thanks, Hannah. Okay, get ready for to laugh because it is time for our joke of the week. Students in Miss Clayton's Honors Drama class at Ashley High School have performed these jokes for the morning show. Now you can start each day off with a dose of humor. Here's our joke of the week. There was this kid taking a test in his class that composed of mainly true and false questions. The kid realized that he didn't know any of the answers and in a fit of inspiration reached into his pocket and pulled out a coin. He decided that if he flipped the coin and it landed on heads, he would choose true. If it landed on tails, he would choose false. He finished the test in a couple of minutes and proceeded to take a nap on his desk. When he woke up, he saw his teacher going around and collecting tests. When the teacher got to his desk, she found the kid flipping the coin furiously. When she asked him what he was doing, he looked at her and said, Well, I had to recheck my answers. Another awesome joke. Thank you, Ashley Honors Drama. And now it's time for a staple here on The Morning Show. This week in history, our Grand Master of Historical Knowledge has all the headlines from past times in This Week in History, brought to you by Kidsville News. Welcome to This Week in History. I'm your historical host, Rocco Solano, covering all the colorful and amazing events that have left their mark on history's timeline. This is the week of May 22nd through May 28th. May 22nd, 1455. On the day, on the day of the opening battle of England's War of the Roses takes place, the Yorkists defeat King Henry VI's forces, and the war would continue on for 30 years. May 23rd, 1934. Famous fugitive, fugitives Kyle Burrow and Bonnie Parker are killed in a police ambush in Louisiana. Police officers from Texas and Louisiana separate, set up along the highway waiting for Bonnie and Clyde to appear, and, the, and they then unloaded 167 bullets at their car. May 24th, 1883. After 14 years and 27 deaths while being constructed, the Brooklyn Bridge over the East River is open, connecting the great cities of New York and Brooklyn for the first time in history. May 25th, 1977. Memorial Day weekend opens with the intergalactic bang as the first of George Lucas's blockbuster Star Wars movies hits American, American theaters. Star Wars saw an incredible success as it received seven Oscars and earned 461 million in U.S. ticket sales. May 26, 1897. The first copies of the classic vampire novel Dracula by Irish writer Bram Stoker appear in London bookshops. Vampires were popular figures in folktales from ancient times, but Stoker's novel encapsulated them into the mainstream of 20th century literature. Finally, your weekend history tidbits. May 27, 1703, after winning access to the Baltic Sea through the victories in the Great Northern War, Caesarus Peter I founded the cities of St. Petersburg as the new Russian capital, making Russia a major European power. May 28, 1957, baseball owners voted unanimously to allow the New York Giants and Brooklyn Dodgers to move to San Francisco and Los Angeles, respectively. That's This Week in History, your ultimate sources for those key moments in time. I'm Rocco Solano. Thanks for stopping by. This 
This Week in History is brought to you by Kidsville News, a fun and effective learning resource for children, teachers, and parents. Kidsville News is always free. Copies are delivered every month to every elementary school in the new Hanover County system. And join us again next time for another journey through time as we explore the fun, fascinating, entertaining, and educational facts that make up This Week in History. We have plenty more of the morning show ahead, including Science Nation and this week's lunch menu. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Seven thousand high school students drop out every school day. Let's catch them before it's too late. To start helping students in your community, visit boostup.org. Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Johanna Carey. And I'm Jessica Finnegan. Memorial Day is this coming Monday. It's a U.S. federal holiday to remember those who died while serving in the armed forces it is celebrated each year on the final Monday in May. The first Memorial Day was celebrated on May 30th, 1868. It was a response to the unprecedented carnage of the Civil War, in which some 620,000 soldiers on both sides died. In 1864, women from Pennsylvania put flowers on the graves of their dead from the just-fought Battle of Gettysburg. The next year, a group of women decorated the ga graves of soldiers buried in Mississippi Cemetery. General Logan, commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, issued an order which set aside May 30th, 1868, as quote for the purpose of stewarding with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves, graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion. Over time, Memorial Day has been expanded and now honors all Americans who have died while in military service. Here are seven things you probably didn't know about the Memorial Day. One, it was originally called Decoration Day to honor the deceased soldiers who would decorate graves of their fallen comrades with flowers, flags, and wreaths. Although Memorial Day became its official title in the 1880s, the, the holiday didn't legally become Memorial Day until 1967. Two, it wasn't always celebrated the last Monday of May. After the Civil War, it was a holiday commemorating fallen soldiers to be observed every May 30th. But due to the Uniform Monday Holiday Act, which took effect in 1971, Memorial Day was moved to the last Monday of May to ensure long weekends. Three. It is legally required to observe a national moment of remembrance in December 2000. Congress passed a law requiring Americans to pause at 3 p.m. local time on Memorial Day to remember and honor the fallen. 4. James A. Carf Carfield delivered a rather lengthy speech at the first Memorial Day ceremony. Garfield was a Civil War general and Republican, congressman not yet a president on May 30th. 1868, when he addressed the several thousand people gathered at Arlington National Cemetery. 5. Several states observe Confederate Memorial Day. In addition to the national holiday, nine states officially set aside a day to honor those who died fighting for the Confederacy in the Civil War. Texas, South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, Virginia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Georgia. 6. Waterloo, New York is considered the birthplace of Memorial Day. According to the town, in 1966, Congress ununanimously passed a resolution to officially recognize Waterloo as the birthplace of the holiday. However, it remains a conscientious debate with other towns. And seven, more than 36 million people will travel at least 50 miles from home this Memorial Day. 
the holiday has been become known as a time for gathering and cookouts. We hope you learned something new from these facts. Don't forget to have a moment of remembrance this Memorial Day. And the reason for your day off. All right, now it's time for our first block of news. Let's send it over to Hannah Bollock, who has several great stories to report. Good morning, Hannah. Good morning, and welcome to Your School News on the Morning Show. I'm Hannah Bollock. Students from Trask Middle School took part in building Lego robots with the support from instructors from the Cape Fear Museum. The outreach program is designed to nurture a lifelong enthusiasm for science, technology, engineering, and math. With the report is Johan Yellow. Although not as sophisticated as R2-D2 or C-3PO, <laughs> the students at Trask Middle School got a chance to build working robots from the ground up. With the help from staff of the Cape Fear Museum's Lego Robot Outreach Workshop, 28 students combined Lego elements with programmable brick motors and sensors. These clever little robots could then be programmed to walk, race, and dance through a challenging course. We're going to try to make this contagious because our goal here is that we currently don't know what the, the jobs are going to be for these kids in their future. But we do know that it's going to have something to do with technology, something to do with robotics. So we're trying to make the uh, interest contagious here at Trask Middle School, get more students maybe on this track. During the workshop, students had the opportunity to experience firsthand the tedious steps involved in building a working robot from scratch. Working in groups of two, they read and followed a detailed manual making sure each intricate piece was added at the appropriate time and spot. How, like, having to build it because some of the pieces look different and some of the pieces look the same and how to, like, move it and get it on that track. So it's been really... Like, it's been difficult to... Students also learned how to program the robots to move forward, backward, and in a circle. They used laptops to write the program using a block-based programming system and connected their robots to the computer. Once connected, they uploaded the program to the robot's control center. You have to learn coding and different types of computer things, like how to, like, hook up the USB cord and download things, and you have to learn how to, like, work together with your partner. Uh, because we've never used them before, and uh, we don't really, like, know how much power and stuff to push, put into it, so we kind of have to, like, trial and error, basically. The workshop captivated the minds of every student involved. Building and programming the robots was a challenging activity, which had results they could see with their own eyes. It was an exciting time for all when the finished robots executed the commands of its operators and creators. Reporting for your school news, this is Johan Yellow. The Sports Entertainment Marketing 2 class at Laney High School created a service learning event to create awareness for drunk driving. Called the Slam Jam, the event featured a student versus faculty basketball game as well as a week of events focusing on educating the public about drunk driving with a fun experience that builds camaraderie among the staff and students. The week included Morn Monday, a student dressed up as the Grim Reaper selected students throughout the day at random, painting their faces white, labeling them as victims of drunk driving. Talk It Out Tuesday, Street Safe and Mike Rossi, a parent of a former Laney student that lost his son to drunk driving, spoke to students about the dangers of drinking and driving. While on Wednesday, everyone wore blue and or lime green for the whole day to spread awareness about drinking and driving. There will also be a mock accident where police and firefighters will demonstrate and explain to students the significance of drunk driving. On average, someone is killed in the U.S. by a drunk driver every 40 minutes. Middle and high school students recently participated in the Southeastern Regional High School Math Contest, Coastal Carolina Community College in Jacksonville. With a complete report on all the details is Sierra Robbins. The Southeastern Regional High School Math Contest is offered in three divisions, Level 1, Level 2, Level 3, and Comprehensive. Students from around the region competed in a written contest of 40 questions that tested their skills in one of three levels. In Level 1, contest taking first place was Jack Hewo from Roland Grice. In second place, Charles Witt from Noble. In fourth place, Kevin Dye from Roland Grice. 
and taking seventh place in level one was Kate Cornelius from Noble. Level two winners were in first place, Jacob Tremesta from Hoggard, in second place, Owen Dean from Noble, in fifth place, Gabriella Kendrala from Ashley, and in sixth place, Lillian Taylor from Wilmington Early College High School. Finally, the winning students from New Hanover County in level three are in first place, Kendall Scott from Laney, in second place, Casey Kaiser from Hoggard, and in fourth place, James Wilt from Hoggard. New Hanover County Schools was well represented at the event, and all of these students advanced to the state contest held in Fayetteville. Reporting for your school news, this is Sierra Robbins. For all of the latest on New Hanover County Schools, join us weekdays at 5.30 p.m. here on Time Warner Cable Channel 5 and Charter Cable Channel 191. For your school news, a complete half hour of all the latest news and information from New Hanover County Schools. Now back to our hosts. Thanks, Hannah. In addition to watching your school news in the morning show, you can see many of NHCS TV's programming online. Just go to the school system website at www.nhcs.net and click on the NHCS TV logo right there on the front page. You can watch great programs there like You Talk, The Forum, and Diversity Matters. It is an excellent way to watch our program wherever you want. Shifting gears now, we continue our show with Science Nation from the National Science Foundation. This feature takes a dynamic, entertaining look at the research and the researchers that will change our lives. From the latest inventions to studies that could change the way we perceive the world, each episode is packed with fascinating information. Imagine glancing up at a glass building and suddenly kilowatts and dollar signs are flowing through your mind. That's what happened to material scientist and chemical engineer Richard Lunt. We've taken solar and kind of flipped it on its head. With support from the National Science Foundation, Lunt and his team at Michigan State University are developing transparent solar panels. We've turned traditional solar cells as these opaque, maybe not so exciting devices to devices that can be completely clear, completely transparent. So it allows you to think about integrating it in completely new ways. A big hurdle is making them more efficient. Traditional solar panels soak up much of the sun's light and convert it to energy. A transparent panel has to let visible light shine through. So the light we can't see with our eyes, like ultraviolet and infrared, has to do the work. In this solar cell, we have very thin coatings of these organic materials and inorganic nanostructured materials that are selectively harvesting the parts of the solar spectrum that you can't see with your eye. We're in the Molecular and Organic Excitonics Laboratory, and this is the heart of where we do a lot of what we do. Another challenge is making the photovoltaic cells transparent. So the team came up with ways to layer patterns onto the cell in a way that makes them uniformly clear. We actually use a variety of different stencils to actually pattern our devices. And each active material will have its own pattern. After every layer, we put down a new stencil, and in this way we can build up very complex structures. This one is so that you can see the pattern, and this, this one is how you would not see the patterning. Material science engineer Margaret Young is testing whether the same process can be used on thin plastic. This is much lighter and much more flexible. So instead of rebuilding windows, we could just put this over an existing window. With the square footage of glass that's on our skyscrapers and on our buildings, there's so much square footage that can be used to generate power. Lund says his transparent cells are already pretty inexpensive to make. And really, I think in the next 20 years, we'll see this type of technology get deployed so that it's all around us, generating power in the background. So really turning our cities and our landscape into solar harvesting systems, solar harvesting surfaces, and solar farms, and really creating a lot of power and not even knowing that it, it's there. Transparent solar cells. There's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. That was another awesome segment from Science Nation. I could see one day in the future 
where every window created solar power energy, and you just connect them to buildings of your home. Yeah, it's great to see how our dependency on non-renewable resources is constantly being lowered thanks to scientists and new inventions. More good work from the National Science Foundation. All right, it's time for a quick break. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. In the small town of Elmira, New York, a boy was born into an all-American family. The odds of him achieving his dream in the fashion industry? One in 23 million. The odds of having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 110. I am Tommy Hilfiger, and my family is affected by autism. Learn more at autismspeaks.org slash signs. Welcome back to The Morning Show. We now bring you a special feature in honor of Memorial Day titled Lessons in Liberty. Several years ago, NHCS TV students sat down with the World War II veterans in one of the interviews and listened to their stories. Today we feature one of those interviews for you at home to enjoy. Megan Bennett, and today we are joined by World War II Navy veteran Jesse Batson. Welcome, Mr. Batson. We're glad to have you with us today. Thank you. Could you tell us about some of your experiences in the Navy? <laughs> Being your experiences in the Navy. Well, I enlisted in the Navy in April of 1934. I went through boot camp in Norfolk, Virginia, 16 weeks. I arrived there in April, latter part of April of 34. And uh, last of August, we finished our boot camp, and I was assigned to the USS, USS Idaho, which was undergoing remodernization in the Navy Yard in Norfolk, Virginia. This was, I went aboard her in September of 34. In January of 35, she made her trial runs after remodernization. Now, we say remodernization. It was the most modern ship the Navy had at that time. No freshwater showers, no laundry facilities. You slept in hammocks. You had a, a little locker, probably about uh, 18 by 24 inches deep. You kept most of your clothes in. They had to be folded a certain way and put in. The, the rest of your clothes were kept in a sea bag. You, everybody had a bucket, so when you took a shower, you would go in, you would get one bucket of fresh water, you would soap yourself down or whatever you wanted to do. To, to warm that water, you hung it on a hook with a steam pipe down into the water, you turned the valve on to the, to the steam, warmed up the water to your temperature. Then you would soak yourself down with fresh water. Then you would get under a salt water shower. And then you would take what remaining fresh water you had and try to get most of the salt water off of you. And the sleeping accommodations, as I said, were hammocks. And uh, if you were lucky enough to be promoted to a third class petty officer, you were entitled to a folding cot. But we went to bed at 9 o'clock. You heard taps, which you hear at a funeral today. Taps went every night at 9 o'clock. The word was passed to turn in your hammocks and keep silence about the ducks. And they meant just what they said. If you were out of that hammock, 
during those hours, other than the go to the, we call the head, you had to explain it to the master at arms. But uh, most of the sailors in the early, in my early Navy career, were products of the Great Depression. They're like me. They went into the Navy to get some food, in the manner of speaking. $21 a month to start with, 36 54 60 Now, 60 was a third-class petty officer. $72 a month was a second-class petty officer. $84 a month was a first-class petty officer. $99 a month was a chief petty officer acting. Now, when he got a permanent appointment, after a couple of years, the pay was $126. But naturally, like everything else, as time went by, the pay scale in the armed forces went up gradually a little bit at a time. Now, when I was promoted to Chief Petty Officer in 1943, my, my pay was $135 a month. So, aboard this destroyer, the Mason, it was eventually, we took it up to uh, Nova Scotia, Halifax, Nova Scotia. It was one of the men least destroyers and turned it over to the British. And then in, we left there and I went back to uh, Philadelphia to receiving ship and was reassigned to another destroyer, the USS Biddle. 151. I didn't stay aboard that very long because it, we had to turn it over to the 90% of the crew ended up as being reserves. So from there, I went to uh, a receiving ship, which was the Oklahoma, and from there I was assigned, I, I looked at the bulletin board one day, at the time I was a gunner's mate, they wanted gunner's mates to change their rate to aviation ordinancemen. So I applied for that and it was it was granted. And I thought I was in sailor's heaven when I went to naval aviation. The duty every fourth day, after having the duty every other day aboard ship is port and starboard, as I said. We hope you enjoyed that special segment this Memorial Day. Try to take a few moments to reflect upon all the men and women who, get, who have given their lives in service of our country. All right, it's time now for this week's lunch menu. This is the menu for Monday, May 22nd through May 29th. On Monday, May 22nd, treat yourself to a fantastic chicken filet sandwich, a lasagna roll up with breadsticks, or corn dog nuggets. Awaken your taste buds with flavor-packed black-eyed peas and diced peaches. Then on Tuesday, May 23rd, munch on some tangy tangerine chicken served with rice and an egg roll, a monster meatball hoagie, or a breathtaking bacon cheese, bacon <laughs> cheeseburger. Also on the menu are sweet potato waffle fries, green beans, and mandarin oranges. On Wednesday, May 24th, how will you ever decide between a corny corn dog nugget or a cheesy cheeseburger or an even cheesier cheesy breadsticks? Finish off the meal with a pasta salad, french fries, and diced pears. Mm. On Thursday, May 25th, enjoy super stuffed crust pizza, a, deli a delicious chicken club sandwich, or popcorn chicken with a roll. Compliment your entree with macaroni salad, veggie sticks, broccoli, and mixed fruit. Then on Friday, May 26, chow down on a hearty hot dog with chili, fishy fish nuggets with hush puppies or crispy chicken nuggets with a roll. While you're in the lunch line, be sure to add baked beans, crunchy carrot sticks, and spiced apples to your plate. Finally, on Monday, May 29th, enjoy your Memorial Day holiday. Be sure to honor America's heroes with a moment of silence. And there you have the lunch menu for the week. In addition to those items, milk, a garden salad, fresh fruit, French bread pizza, and a peanut butter and jelly combo will be, will be available daily. So many delicious choices 
Don't forget, you can also start your day off with a healthy and hearty breakfast at school. We now have our new episode of our outdoor segment, Gardening and Nature, brought to you by the Cape Fear Garden Club. Today, they will take us on a tour and tell us all about the sensory garden at Wrights Brightsboro Elementary. Here's Gardening and Nature with host Barbara Downing. Good morning and welcome to Gardening in Nature. This morning we are at Wrightsboro Elementary to learn about um, a project here called the Sensory Garden. School social worker Sammy Dorsey will explain the value and use of the Sensory Garden. Um, how did you come up with this idea, Mr. Dorsey? Well, you know, in working with the kids on different levels, you know, I realized that one of the ways that to help them um, you know, develop the skills they need, you know, is understanding their senses. And I thought, okay, what better way to develop and understand your senses than actually being able to go out in the garden and to use them. So over the years, we've put in different plants that focus on different senses. And at times I bring the kids out here and, you know, they love coming out and seeing what smells like what and touching the plants and listening. So um, you actually use this to bond or to yes. interact with the children or make them? Yeah, you know, a lot of times, you know, when they're having a rough day, sometimes the best thing is just to come out into the garden and having different plants that, you know, that they can touch and smell. You know, it kind of gives them a moment to, a um, moment of mindfulness, you know, to where they can really be exactly where they're at. And, you know, and it's a good transition to go back into the class. Right. Well, those of us who are gardeners do, uh, do appreciate and understand that. Um, how do the plantings themselves connect to the five senses? I know you have a variety here. If you could explain some of yeah, it. Yeah, so we've got a touch. We have a um, wonderful plant right here. Lambs here. You know, the, oh. kids, the kids love coming oh, and touching yeah. that. And, you know, and they're blown away when they touch it. You know, like it's so soft. Uh, right. So we have that. And then we have the different herbs from lemon balm. Uh, you know, the kids always want a little piece of lemon balm. We have cilantro, um, you know, oregano, parsley, and then of course the flowers themselves give off different smells. Um, right. And then for the uh, hearing, the wind, the leaves, the grasses, as the different grasses come in, you'll be able to, you know, hear them. And it is that moment of mindfulness to where they can really stop and just listen. And then even the taste, you know, like with the, the lemon balm and the oregano and the uh, cilantro, uh, and then just the visual, being able to come out here and look at everything. And even at different times, seeing the plants as they grow. Oh, yeah. I mean, the beauty of the colors uh, you are know, just... Uh, and, you know, and it does. It, bring, it really brings the kids to a moment to where they are, you know, in that moment. And, you know, and they're thinking and focusing on what's right there. And it's teaching them those skills that they can take back into the classroom and in their lives, you know, on being mindful of where you're at and what you're feeling and what's around you. Right. Yeah. Um, you were mentioning that this is sort of a self-perpetual yes. garden. Yeah. One of the things we're doing as we're putting in plants is when we put plants in, we think, okay, what will eventually take care of itself? You know, so that we're not having to spend a lot of time out here watering, uh, you know, and pruning and things like that. So we're really, as this grows in, it'll be just like this little nature preserve on its own that attracts, you know, birds, bees, butterflies at different times throughout the season. So yeah, we're really hoping that, you know, as this grows in, it'll, it'll sustain itself. And I, I heard them discuss the pumpkin over there where they yeah. actually had put yeah. a pumpkin. Yep back from October, it descended yeah. over there and it has rotted yep. and has also started to grow again. Yeah, exactly. The fifth grade did a little science experiment where they wanted to see what, you know, a pumpkin would do over time and it eventually disappeared into the ground and now we have a pumpkin plant coming up. So the kids are amazed with all of oh, this. Oh, I can see that. And plus you have benches where they can sit yep. and uh, nice do, picnic table. do they ever come out and read out oh, here? Oh, you know, often, you know, even the parents that come in for lunch, once they realize this is out here, you'll see them out here eating lunch, you know, and same thing with the kids and the teachers. You know, the whole school tends to use it for a place to kind of that mindfulness moment. So, oh, well, this yeah. is just wonderful. And I know the children appreciate it and I'm sure their parents appreciate it, and uh, we as uh, gardeners <laughs> appreciate it Always. also. Always, yeah. Back to you.
Thank you, Miss Downing and the Cape Fear Garden Club. That was very interesting. All right, everyone get a pen and paper ready. It's time for our morning show math question. This is a challenging problem for you to solve at home. We'll give you the question now and then solve it for you after the break. So put on your thinking caps and get ready to solve our question because here it is. Okay, we hope you got that down. Spend a minute working it out and we will have the answer after this short break. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Johanna Carey. And I'm Jessica Finnegan. Before the break, we showed you our morning math show question. Were you able to solve it correctly? Here's Elizabeth Crace, math teacher at Murray Middle School, with a solution. Break. Good morning, our math problem of the day. John bought a new car for $9,000. That sounds like a deal. The sales tax rate on the car is 3%. How much sales tax did John pay? Well, if he bought a car for $9,000 and the sales tax on the car is 3%. So in order for me to um, figure this out, I'm going to end up multiplying the amount of the car with the sales tax and then finding the total price. In order for me to do that, I can't really do any math with the percentage, so I have to change it to a decimal. So I'm going to add a decimal at the end and move it over two places, so I have 0 0.03%. Uh, percent, and now I'm going to multiply it. When you multiply, you do not have to line up your decimal points. I'm just going to multiply through, so this is 0, 0, 0, 27. And because the zero is my next number, I don't have to worry about that either. If you count, I have two numbers that fall after the decimal point. So I'm going to start at the end. I'm going to go one, two over and put a decimal. So $270 is what John has to pay for taxes. Well, if his car costs $9,000 and I'm paying $270 in taxes, I'm going to add them together. When you add and subtract decimals, you do have to line your decimal points up. Where when you multiply, you do not, you count the decimal places. So I'm going to do some math here, zero, zeros, zero and seven, two. So John is going to pay $9,270 for his new car. And now back to the studio. <laughs> We hope you enjoy our morning show math problem, and we got those brain juices flowing. Each week we'll feature a new problem for you to solve. It is time for NC Happenings. Everyone should get out their pen and paper as we take a trip across the state and look at all the places and events in the next coming month. Whether you're looking for adventure or relaxation, mountains or beaches, the rhythm of city life or the tranquility of nature, there is, something, there is something happening for everyone here in North Carolina. Date, June 3rd, Plymouth. Event, NC Black Bear Festival. The NC Black Bear Festival will have over 30 activities and a 5K run, where you can see the bears. There will also be a paddle event, black bear photography workshop, a black bear train ride, and much more. Admissions for adults, 
is $15. Children 12 and under are 10. For more information, contact 252-793-6627 or go to the website ncbearfestivefest.com. Date, June 9th through the 10th, Place, Washington, event. Washington Summer Festival this year, Washington, North Carolina, is hosting a summer festival including an annual street fair featuring food, arts and crafts, and commercial vendors. There will also be free concerts, a kid's zone with children's entertainment, and much more. Admission is free. For more information, call 252-946-9168 or visit their website at wbcchamber.com. Date, June 16th through 18th. Place, Sparta. Event, NC Mountain Arts Adventure. 16 studios and galleries will host this celebration of creativity. Get to know the artists and the craftspeople. Watch them at workshop and shop in their unique studio and gallery settings. This event will start at 10 a.m. and end at 5 p.m. Admission is free. For more information about the special event contract, 336-372-5473 or go to ncmountainartsadventure.com. Date, June 23rd, Place Blowing Rock event. Blowing Rock Mile of Flowers tour. The stunning gardens by Blowing Rock homes and churches will, with garden guides available to provide information about the plants and flowers. The gardens will be within several blocks of the center of town in this self-guided event, so go at your own pace. This event will start at 9.30 a.m., ending at 4 p.m. For more information, call 828-295-0901. Date, June 30th. Place, West Jefferson. Event, annual Christmas and July festival. Visit the historic downtown West Jefferson and the beautiful Ash Country for the annual Christmas and July festive. Festival, sorry. Friday evening, join the festival kickoff featuring live music from a local band performing a country bluegrass mix beginning at 3 p.m. Thing wrap up at 4 p.m. Food vendors and special farmers will open at 5 p.m. So you don't want to miss it. Admission is free. For more information, contact 336-846-2787 or visit the website christmasinjuly.info. If these events weren't enough for you or you are looking for something different to do, then check out the website www.visitnc.com. Under the upcoming events tab, you'll be able to sort out and search for something that suits your need. Now it's time for your school news. So let's send it back over to our news anchor, Hannah Bullock. Thank you, Johanna and Jessica. And welcome everyone to your school news here on The Morning Show. 47 students from New Hanover County and 5 from Pender County will attend Southeast Area Technical High School this fall. To welcome, to the new students, to welcome the students to their new campus, C-Tech held a luncheon and tour of the facilities. With a complete report is YSN reporter Bridget Donovan. The first class to attend the Southeast Area Technical High School gathered in the bb t Auditorium on the north campus of CFCC for luncheon. The event was not only an opportunity for the students to get to know their fellow classmates, but also a chance to get to know the school's new administration and tour many of the buildings they will be using for classes. The north campus of CFCC will house CTEC during its first two years while a permanent school is being built. Uh, this high school is very, very special to me. Like, I don't even have to be in the ninth grade yet. Just the career plans it offers and the career pathways it gives is something that really stuck out to me for a long time. So I've seen this as like this dream opportunity that I thought it would never exist. A total of 59 students representing over 17 middle schools in the New Hanover and Pender County area have been accepted to the Southeast Area Technical High School in the fall of 2017. Planning for the school stepped onto a fast track over the past year as, ad as administrators planned for the August 14th opening. Principal Edith Skipper, formerly the principal at Pender Early College High School, started last month and the rest of the staff will join in June. 
when we're thinking about building a culture in a new setting, it's really important, the relationships are really important, and so bringing students from across the county together, it's really important to us to let them get to know each other. Also known as CTEC, the school is designed to help students explore career opportunities and provide a focus in hands-on, project-based learning. Students can access certificate, diploma, and degree programs from over 63 different career and technical majors the college offers. I'm just excited because there's a lot more classes that I can take and more one-on-one -on -one with teachers and more hands-on activities. Um, I signed up for CTEC so I could better understand um, what I'm wanting to do in life and pursue my career, which is um, hospitality and tourism. I want to become a baker. I want to advance into software development and work for Google. When a student graduates from CTEC, their plan will guide them directly into the workforce or allow them to continue with additional education and skills training. Reporting for your school news, this is Bridget Donovan. Students who are part of Bradley Creek Elementary's Enrichment Club were given the opportunity to use Spheros to create a battle bot to compete in an epic battle. Spheros are the first robotic ball gaming devices that allows operators to control the units from smartphones or tablets. Before the competition began, students first learned to navigate their bots through a series of golf holes, programming the Spiro to follow the line and ultimately get it in the hole. Students use problem solving, programming, and angle understanding and measurement to be successful. Once the basics were learned, students engineered their bots for competition. Once students came to the realization that they weren't going to break the bots, the battles became a real joy. The challenge focused on students to be able to strategically pop a balloon attached to another bot's armor. Students and teachers both had a great time as they learned about robotics and engineering. Finally, New Hanover County Schools is proud to announce the graduation ceremonies for the class of 2017. Traditional high school graduation ceremonies are scheduled for Saturday, June 10, 2017 at Trask Coliseum on the campus of the University of North Carolina Wilmington. Ashley High School will start the day off with their ceremony at 9 a.m. Hoggard High School's commencement will follow at 12.30 p.m. And at 4 p.m., New Hanover High School will hold their ceremony, with Laney High School's commencement at 7.30 p.m. The Early College High School graduation ceremonies will be held as follows. Isaac Bear Early College High School, Saturday, June 3rd at 10 a.m. at Keenan Auditorium on the campus of UNCW. Wilmington Early College High School's ceremony is Saturday, May 27th at 10 a.m. at Cape Fear Community College Humanities and Fine Arts Center. While the, Career Readiness at, while the Career Readiness Academy at Mosley Performance Learning Center commencement will be Friday, June 9th at 7 p.m. at Snipes Academy of Art and Design. Please note that the traditional graduation high school graduation ceremonies will be televised and streamed live here on the Learning Network. That's all for now. To watch this week's edition of Your School News Online, visit the school system's website at www.nhcs.net and click on the NHCS TV's logo on the home page. Now back over to Johanna and Jessica. Thanks, Hannah. Now to end today's show, we have a brand new morning show trivia game. I've been told today's trivia challenges focuses on American history. It might be a tough one. We'll find out soon enough. Let's send it back over to Hannah, who has all the detail details. Welcome back, Hannah. Thank you. Today, we have an exciting and new morning show trivia challenge. I will ask a trivia question about America and its history. If you think you know the answer, you must buzz. The first person to buzz gets to answer. If you blurt out an answer without buzzing or winning the buzz, it will not count. Also, is if you buzz before I finish asking the question, then you have to answer it then. I will not finish reading the rest. If you get it wrong, your opponent gets a chance to answer. Finally, if you are both stumped on one, I will give the answer and we will move on. There are 17 questions. Okay, contestants, are you ready? Yep, <laughs> let's do this. Here we go. The first question. Whose face is featured on a $2 bill? That's you. John Adams. Oh, I guess I can't finish. I didn't give you the John answer Adams. choices. So. John Adams. No. All right. Mm -hmm. um, do you mind reading out the answers to that question? 
Okay. I don't know. Am I allowed to finish reading the answers? Um, John Adams, John is Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Millard Fillmore. Um, I'm going to go with Millard Fillmore. That is incorrect. Oh, okay. The correct answer was Thomas Jefferson. Okay. Okay, okay next question. Feeling. Which president is not on Mount Rushmore? A, George Washington, B, John Adams, C, Thomas Jefferson, or D, Theodore Roosevelt? Uh, John Adams. Correct. That is correct. Cool. Points. Okay. Cool. Um, how many stripes are on the American flag? Thirteen. Correct. Um, what was the first state? Virginia. Um, no. Is that not? All right, all right. Is Can you read out um, the answers, races? Yes. Um, Delaware, New York, Massachusetts, or Philadelphia? Delaware. Correct. I was hoping you'd say Philadelphia because it's not a state. <laughs> okay. Which president never belonged to a political party? Herbert Hoover, Grover Cleveland, George Washington, or James Monroe? I'm going to go with James Monroe. That is incorrect. Um, I'm going to go with George Washington. That's correct. It's too yeah. early for parties. <laughs> He's the first president. <laughs> the, <okay. laughs> um, which president served in both world wars? A, Gerald Ford, B, Benjamin Franklin, uh, ben Franklin Roosevelt, <laughs> C, Dwight D. Eisenhower, or D, John F. Kennedy? Um, I'm going to go for Eisenhower. That is correct. Hey! <laughs> you know your I, history. I know something. <laughs> um, who was the first president to be born in a hospital? A, Jimmy Carter, B, Ronald Reagan, C, Abraham Lincoln, or D, Glover, Grover Cleveland? Ronald Reagan? That is incorrect. Um, I'm going to go for whatever B was. That was Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, okay, um, can you read off the answers again? <laughs> um, um, Jimmy Carter, yeah. Ronald Reagan, Abraham Lincoln, or Grover Cleveland? Um, I'm going to go for Jimmy Carter. Uh, that's correct. Who oh, are you? Hey. <laughs> okay. Uh, who was the only bachelor president? A, William Taft. B, James Buchanan. You might want to reset that. Oh, yeah, that'd be good. Uh, C, you. William McKinley, or D, Grover Cleveland? Oh, I already pressed it. Yeah. Um, could you repeat the answer choices again? Uh, A, William Taft, B, mm -hmm. James Buchanan, C, William McKinley, or D, Grover Cleveland? I feel like James is a bachelor name, so I'm going to go with James. That's actually correct. Oh, <laughs> oh. go James. <laughs> Okay, who was the oldest person elected president? A, Ronald Reagan, B, Bill Clinton, C, James Buchanan, or D, James Polk? A. Uh, correct. Oh, Ronald okay, Reagan. I just guessed because I panicked. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the oldest capital city in the U.S.? Santa Fe, New Mexico, New York, New York, Washington, D.C., or Atlanta, Georgia? Um... I'm going to go with Atlanta. That is incorrect. Okay. Could you repeat the answer choices? <laughs> Santa Fe, New Mexico, New York, New York, Washington, D.C., or Atlanta, Georgia? Washington, D.C.? I oh, know that's not it. Never mind. Never mind. No, what is, is, that, that is not that, correct. That, 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 the correct <laughs> answer is Santa Fe, New Mexico, founded okay. in 1610. You learn something new every day. <laughs> um, so there will be no more stealing for this next part because oh it will be true and false. Okay. It's 50 um, mm -hmm. So okay. the first true and false question. The 4th of July fireworks were first used as a mockery of the tradition of fireworks for British royalty. True or false? True. That is correct. <laughs> oh, <geez>. The Star Spangled <laughs> Banner is set to the tune of an old English drinking song. True. That is correct. The national capital was originally New York, New York. False. That's correct. It was Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Right? <laughs> 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 okay. Um, yeah, true, false. 
President Lincoln kept important notes and papers tucked in his famous top hat. Um, I'm going to go false. That is incorrect. It's actually true. Oh, he I would say do true. that. Oh, poor Abe. I'm sorry. <laughs> I say true. I doubted him. Arlington National Cemetery was originally a plantation owned by George Washington. True. False. Oh, did I get it? it? Oh, no. <laughs> it was owned by General Robert E. Lee. Oh, I knew that. Do no, I get I the point? No, because you can't steal. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, never mind. Okay. I, I know you said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Continue on. <laughs> sorry. Oops, I accidentally My colleague it. here. Okay. <laughs> Two more questions to go. Gerald Ford is the only president to have been an only child. False. False. Actually, no president has been an only child. Wow. And finally, Barack Obama was the youngest person to serve as president. I think I'm going to go with false on that. That is correct. False. Oh, oh, the winner! No. Guess who's the winner? I was going to guess false, and then you beat me to it because I was overthinking. <laughs> all right. That's all the questions. Um, and our morning show trivia challenge winner is Johanna. Congratulations. Good game, Jessica. Good game, Johanna. Okay. <laughs> Well, that does it for this edition of The Morning Show. Remember, for the best TV of all each and every day, keep it tuned right here for New Hanover County Schools TV on the Learning Network. Have a great day and a wonderful week.